Okay, I think we can start with this um, session on the EOS Cavalry Doctor program. Uh, I'd like to thank you to all the attendees and the five speakers that uh, we will uh, uh, describe today the result of the EOS Cavalry Doctor pilot. Mm, the session is organized uh, in, uh, um, with, the, first of all, an introduction presentation to the EOS Cavalry Doctor pilot developed by USCAB that I, I will give the, this presentation. And then, uh, as I said, we have, will have five presentations of uh, different pilots that has been uh, um, that has been selected in the context of this uh, of this um, program. Let me share my, my slide. Okay. I'm uh, Diego Scardaci. I work uh, for the Jai Foundation as a technical solution lead, uh, and I'm also the co-chair of the activity manager board of the EOSCAB uh, project. I, uh, I was involved since the early to this uh, uh, to the conception on this of this EOSC early adopter program, and I will give you some insight about why we decided to launch this program and how it's going. First, 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 I'd like to remind you how our housekeeping rules. Uh, the session will be recorded and made available afterwards. Please stay muted and keep your video off during the presentation. And you, you can ask your question in the chat uh, during the session. Now, let's uh, let's introduce the EOSCAB Adopter Program. The EOSCAB, the EOSCAB launched the EOSCAB Adopter Program in 2019. The idea is, was to mm, offer to research communities the latest state of our technology and services available within EOSC, and in the same time, to allow researchers community to scale up the in-house infrastructure and to access a richer set of resources and services. So as you can see, we, we define a twofold objective. For one side, we would like to, uh, to uh, would, we, we would like to allow user communities to benefit of advanced services for distributed computing, data management, and so on. And from the other side, we would like uh, to allow the research community also benefit of the wider set of resources available within EOSC. Saying this, uh, another very important aspect that uh, is related to the EOSC adopter program is try to, to gain sight, gain a requirements, needs from the user community to involve them in the uh, development of EOSC. So trying to drive the future development of EOSC according to the needs of the user communities. The EOSC Adopter program offers services for the um, stage of the data management cycle. Then we have services for data discovery and reuse. We have services for data processing analysis, services for data management, curation and preservation, and services for data access, deposition and sharing. In addition to this, we also offer a set of federation services like uh, the authentication authorization, monitoring, the accounting that could be beneficial for the user community. All the services have been published and are accessible through the EOSC portal and marketplace. And it's also worth to mention that the EOSC Hub organized this program in collaboration with some partners, in particular the OCRE project, the, the OpenAI 2020 project, and Giant. Um, the peculiarity of the early adopter program is that it's not devoted to a specific uh, scientific communities, but we have pilots from diverse communities. So we are trying to satisfy the needs of uh, communities coming from different domains and trying to mm, define solutions that can be common from uh, these communities with different backgrounds. As a result uh, uh, of two calls launched in 2019, we selected 13 research projects uh, to be supported within uh, the EOSC Early Adopter Program. And we called them EOSC Early Adopter Program Pilots. And five of them will be presented uh, with more details today, with in particular um, 
uh, a lighting uh, the result of the integration activities they did with the EOSC. In uh, this slide, in the next, I summarized uh, some uh, or I, I, summar I summarized the, the, the pilot that we are supporting. In general, it's important to mention that these pilots, uh, in overall, they are they have planned 75 integration with services offered by EOSC, services like the EGI Cloud Compute, you data be to find EGI check in for AI or you data be to access for AI, the Indigo orchestrator to manage uh, complex workflow in, uh, in cloud, and so on, and many others. Um, going quickly to the list, we have the EOSC DevOps framework and virtual infrastructure from Amplifier Common Fair Services. This is a pilot that is coming from one of, one of the cluster projects funded by the European Commission, the Amplifier Cluster Project, that is uh, testing some services of the, um, of the EOSC. Then we have MSO Eric that is working on transitioning the data management platform they developed in the context of uh, their activity to pre-production and then to fully production. Then we have towards a global federated framework for open science cloud that is a pilot that involves researchers from Africa and China to use, use services on top of the Sanisa cream of science resources. Then we have the supporting fair data discoverability in clinical research that is a pilot from ECLIN that will be presented uh, today about uh, that is related on deploying on EOSC a metadata repository called database and some metadata conversion tools. Then we have a pilot uh, that uh, is exploiting earth observation data, in particular Copernicus data, to support uh, ag 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 in particular agricultural user domains but also to, we'll see with a detailed presentation later, to try to define a general receipt to support also um, different use cases, uh, uh, exploiting earth observation case. Then we have the OpenAIDA lab platform for cloud computing in material science. In this case, this pilot is working on deploying a Kubernetes uh, infrastructure in the EJF federated cloud compute to to allow the deployment and operation of open AIDA lab instance in EOSC. Then we have the integration of toxology risk assessment services into the EOSC marketplace. This is a pilot coming from the Open Risk Net project. It's about de developing and deploying on EOSC an infrastructure for safety assessment. Aginfra Plus, this is a, a pilot that is related to deploy on EOSC a data miner cluster and to make it available to mm, all different communities served by the IG Infra Plus infrastructure. Message AX Globium is a, a project performing modeling studies to explore how future energy system can evolve to quantify the trade-off, the interlinkage between different aspects of the global energy system. Starts for all, that is a pilot working on uh, light pollution. Plant phenotyping that will be presented today in more details. That is about uh, using EOSC resources and services to manage and uh, analyze uh, massive plant, plant phenotypic data set involving millions of plant images. Then we have the Open Biomaps Data Management Services for Biological Science and Biodiversity Conservation that is deploying on EOSC a large platform that would allow multiple users to run projects related to natural conservation and biodiversity data. And finally, we have Vespa Cloud, that Vespa is a mature project with 50 providers working with the observation data and the goal is to use the USQ services services to also best provider services. As you can see, the pilot that are covered by this program are, are covering a very wide set of different scientific domains and all of them are benefiting from current USQ services services to offer their services to their user community. If you would like to get more insight on the EOSC Adopted Pilot, you can visit the dedicated web page that we developed in the EOSC Hub website. There is also a video that uh, summarizes what, what is the EOSC Adopted Pilot program.
Finally, I'd like to conclude with the agenda of the today's session. After this, my introduction, we'll go into the details for five selected pilots, uh, transitioning EMS Eric Data Management Platform to production from Ivan Rodero from EMS Eric, big data analytics for agriculture monitoring using Copernicus Sentinels and the European data set uh, from Guido Lemoyne from GRC. Open AIDA Lab platform for cloud computing and material science for Alex Yakutovic, EPFL, supporting fair data discoverability in clinical research from Sergei Goyanin from Equin, and finally, towards an infrastructure for plant prototyping from Vincent Negre from IRA. I think uh, uh, that's all from my side. If there are no questions on this introduction, I think we can directly move to the first presentation. That will be the one from uh, Ivan Lodero from MSO Eric. Thank you, Diego. Uh, should I share my screen or do you want to use yes. uh, okay. If you can share it, this would be fine. Hopefully you can see my slide in, in full screen mode. Yes, uh, it works well. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. You can start when you're ready. So thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present in this forum. Uh, I will spend the next uh, few minutes uh, describing our efforts that we have been working over the last month uh, together with uh, the EGI team as part of the uh, early adopters program that uh, they were just described. And I will start uh, just describing uh, what is EMSO ERIC. I like to say that uh, EMSO became an ERIC in 2016. This is uh, a consortium uh, composed uh, with a number of observatories or sites. In this case, in this figure, I'm showing you 11 of them in blue colors. We have eight of them as a fixed point site and three testing sites. But also I have included this, uh, this bot, dot here in, in, in sort of a, a different color, which is a, a new uh, member joining us in January, which is Norway. We're extremely happy to, to welcome them to the, to the consortium. And the mission of, uh, of, the, of the area is to uh, provide observations uh, of the sea, sea, <laughs> sea floor and the water column in different oceans, oceans uh, providing uh, variables of interest. And the idea is uh, trying to provide add value, combining all of these uh, different observing systems as opposed to individual observatories. Uh, but we are operating as a distributed research infrastructure. The actual um, mission of, of the ERIC as well is providing uh, responses to help uh, resolving uh, different challenges such as climate change or natural hazards or biodiversity. And our main goal is doing that through uh, providing the community with access to high quality uh, data, but also data products and services. And we are working towards that using um, um, some sort of data management platform that uh, we have been uh, working on and I will present uh, within the next few slides. I like to start off uh, by presenting the workflow that we have right now. In this figure, you can see at the left side what we call the regional facilities. These are the different um, uh, sites uh, delivering um, data from sensors that are deployed in the water. These uh, facilities, they have their own local workflows. They have their personnel uh, acquiring this data from the sensors, doing the, the right curation and so on. And they eventually decide to use some sort of um, data source uh, that could be a national data center, or it could be some sort of repository or portal, APIs, tools that are dedicated to oceanographic data. And they offer this data to the user community. But at this point, these are, uh, as I mentioned before, distributed and also they are heterogeneous. Uh, we have to think that all of these uh, regional facilities were operating much earlier than when the uh, MSO became an area. 
So in order to provide this add value service and products that I mentioned before, and they are in the right side of the figure, we had some sort of a gap that this cloud is providing. And we are doing that uh, through some sort of data management. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, next, we use some sort of harmonization. And also we use tools like AirDAP, which also offers another way to expose APIs and to expose services to the users. And we are doing that with the help of EGA resources in order to provide um, a tailored uh, solution to our user community and also a robust, scalable and with quality of service warranties because we can take care of those things and at the same time provide uh, full traceability of our data. Also, our mission is delivering data to existing networks and aggregators like Copernicus and, and Mnet, and also we are doing this at this point and we are complementing that with the services and, and products that we are building that they are tailored to, to MSOA. The actual implementation of that has been also supported uh, by, for instance, Emrefer. So this harmonization system that I mentioned before, this cloud that you can see here again, is uh, following these fair principles and also is, is looking for EOS guidelines for the implementations. And we have been using a prototyping and refining um, approach in which we have different iterations and we are adding and building more functionalities. We have uh, this harmonization subsystem that uses ocean site specifications for the data and metadata. And uh, we have an API that allows us to build uh, different uh, services like dashboards, uh, data portals, and also environments for our um, users to, to do analytics or for doing any sort of processes they need to do. We are linking this data that we derive from the sources with the actual uh, data sources. So they always have a link to the source data through the OI and other persistent identifiers. And it just, just to mention this quickly, also in this field, you see this sort of harmonized data metadata, which is readily, uh, readily accessible through our analytics platform, which allows us to build a quick analytics on those data. Uh, just a quick uh, overview of that. This API is basically a, an open API specification. We use a Swagger-based API and that provides us with uh, programmatic access to that. This is in evolution and the one I'm showing right now at this point, I think, uh, is, is going to become um, probably updated within the next few weeks. We have also other services, as I mentioned before, this sort of file explorer, which is ready, ready uh, data accessible uh, from uh, the, the web. We have data portal that provides also information to the user community and also links to these data sources and a number of dashboards. Some of them are internal and others we are making them external to the users as well for uh, playing with data and trying to get insights from this data. Finally, this uh, virtual environment is providing us a, a great tool, not only for the scientists to do their analytics, and I know that there are also uh, these sort of services offered uh, by, uh, for instance, EGI, but in this case, we can customize uh, our services, and we have been using also these sort of tools for providing training. For instance, earlier this year in February in Athens, we delivered the, our first training and, and, and basically tutorial on how to use and, and how to work with uh, MSO data in this sort of environments. Moving into the actual um, topic of the discussion, um, I like to mention that on the one hand, what we have been using for um, creating this harmonization subsystem or, or platform that we use, uh, tools that are coming from previous efforts such as MSODEF. It was a project uh, that was funded by the EU with the goal of providing foundations for MSOED corporations. And the EOS Hyper Readopters program has been instrumental for us to have continuity at the end of this project and to be able to transition these services that I mentioned before into uh, production. So in particular, given uh, the resources we have obtained, we have access to uh, EGI Cloud Compute Services, also EGI Online Storage, and we build a technical plan together with, uh, with EGI uh, uh, folks and we have been working on that. I like to acknowledge this in this uh, box here in the bottom of the slide, uh, but that will be in all my presentations uh, for, for today. The technical plan is described briefly here. You have at the, le on the left side uh, the, the plan, so basically the different items and the activities conducted during the, the course of this, of this project, which now we are in the fourth quarter. And we can be working in different aspects. Uh, on the one hand, I'm going to emphasize the actual deployment of the infrastructure and how we have done this. 
And on the other hand, I'm going to also refer to one of the important capabilities that uh, for us uh, has been an important uh, effort, which is the AI, authentication and authorization infrastructure. And besides that, in the, in the, in the course of, of this uh, project, we have been working with EGI on a number of things. For example, having access to OpenStack deployments. Uh, and for instance, we were coming from Open Nebula, and all of this happened seamlessly for us. Also, we have been working on deploying other tools, such as LDAP, or uh, we have built uh, some sort of data services, such as the data lab that we mentioned. We have engaged with um, DUI providers as part of this project. Uh, in this particular case, we have engaged with DataSite, and we have become members of DataSite. Um, also, we have been working on the architecture that I'm going to mention next, which is a different architecture for failover and for basically business continuity. And uh, we have been also working together with DGI to find uh, ways for uh, sustaining these uh, uh, resources moving forward, because uh, this uh, project has been, as I mentioned, instrumental for the, the work continuity, but the next steps are going to be through uh, this infra EOS proposal that uh, I think is, is going to uh, start uh, hopefully soon. And uh, as part of this effort also, we have become uh, members of EGI, which are very, we are very happy to, to, to do. So let me just uh, concentrate on this couple of things that I mentioned before. The actual deployment, the architecture that we have followed for the deployment of this um, uh, deployment uh, plan or this um, data management platform is based on two sites delivered uh, through EGI. The, the, the primary data center we are working with is in Recas in Bari, in Italy. Here is hosting, and I'm going to provide a bit a few more details in the next slide. The main services we have uh, publicly accessible and they are operational. And then in the in the left side in in Spain in Tesga, we have uh, some services that are distributed. In other cases, they are uh, services are running in in this data center for convenience. But in most importantly, is that we are running uh, failover deployments of uh, the core services for uh, basically disaster recovery and more importantly for business continuity in case of any potential failures or misconfigurations or some sort of problems in the primary data center. This is uh, this slide is summarizing some of these services. Um, in the top, I just uh, provided a, a bit more details on the, the resources in Recas and Bar in Italy. As you can see, we have three columns. At the left side, we have the production uh, infrastructure. Then we also have, we, we have to support the testing or the staging services uh, and then the, the development environment. Uh, this is just uh, the number of them. In most of the cases, they are cluster solutions. So each of these, uh, they have a number of uh, resources and in this case, virtual, machine, virtual machines associated with them. And uh, basically we have most of these uh, resources mirrored in, in Tesga uh, for failover, as I mentioned. And some of the services like dashboards that are basically linked to the data sources, the databases in the back end, they are going to be available in, in, the, in Tesga. Uh, just because uh, uh, we can, uh, in some sense, take um, be more flexible in the access to users to these sort of tools, because the, the core data and the core services will be running in the other data center. I have to say that during uh, the course of the project, since the first quarter of this year, we have had about 100% of time, no significant incidents at all. So it has been quite reliable and stable, and we are happy with that. The second thing that I like to emphasize is the implementation of the third identity management or the AI. So we engage with EGI for that and we decided to go ahead uh, using the EGI check-in service as a main uh, way to get access to federated identity management. This is a great solution because uh, we can offer our users with uh, many uh, options for, for, for instance, logging into the, the infrastructure. Our approach for authentication is to have open access to the, I would say, more uh, typical services or core services, for instance, getting access into a plot of a time series of a specific variable that is going to be open. However, there are other services that we need to really uh, have more control and for those we need authentication and also for providing a more personalized uh, uh, user experience. So. For that, we have developed that. Uh, so this is based on single sign-on. We have used um, different. We have looked into different potential architecture solutions, and eventually we have followed the ARC blueprint architecture. And as you can see in this slide, this is just uh, some sort of um, 
screenshot of the the development uh, infrastructure that we have right now and it's going to be made available very soon in which uh, you can go with uh, google and also eci check in as a main uh, ways for um, uh, authentication there are also other questions uh, with uh, with this uh, ai implementation uh, for example we have integrated that with our data portal so in this case we can use this sort of authentication for uh, getting access uh, to infrastructure like the virtual database environment and also it provides uh, access to tools that uh, needs to be controlled due to potential uh, overloads in case of not controlling the users and basically being difficult to do it without a specific authentication. And basically that's what I have for, for today. So uh, I'll be happy to respond to any questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Ivan. I don't see any question in the chat. Okay, uh, I, a very general question from my side, Ivan. Uh, in general, what is your opinion of the of this program that we have launched, and uh, um, if we will have similar experience in the future, what do you think can be improved? So I think, uh, well, in, in this case, since we have a long story, as I mentioned before, I mean the, the engagement with AGI has been for for a while. I think this has been a great framework for having continuity, but I have to recognize if uh, we had to start this from the scratch without the resources, or in this case, we do have resources that they are completely uh, uh, heterogeneous in some cases, they are distributed. And as you know, building depending on what uh, uh, services are more challenging to be done in this way. So having access to some um, resources funded by you in some sense, that uh, can let you to start up your projects without having to invest in uh, commercial clouds, for example, it gives us a, a huge opportunity. So I think probably for similar projects, that would be great for really uh, kicking off the project and getting on a speed. And while doing that, quickly you figure out that this is not just a question of the access to the resources, it's not just a question of uh, credit into cloud uh, providers, it's more than that. So what we get from, and I forgot that to, to mention that, uh, what we get also from uh, this project is access to knowledge and to personnel working in these uh, resource providers, for example, through EGI. So you, we have, uh, without uh, having to worry about cybersecurity, we have a lot of policies in place. We do have uh, people that can give us, uh, you know, advice and expertise on that. In the same in the same manner, we could potentially look for other services that are available. And we have looking for the main services that we needed to get started. But uh, for other projects that uh, are moving in the same direction, they would probably uh, do it the same way. In terms of potential ways to improve that, maybe what um, what I would uh, like to see you know, is probably a longer term sort of project, but I understand the goal for this project is to just kick this off and, and help uh, these projects to get started and to find engagements. Um, so I think probably just having these uh, calls for a bit longer period, that would be probably a bit uh, convenient, but I think besides that, I think it's pretty well defined and structured. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan, for your nice word, your very nice presentation. Uh, we can move to the next speaker in the session, that is uh, Guido. Uh, Guido um, will present the pilot Big Data Analytics for agricultural monitoring using Copernicus Sentinel and the U Open dataset. I would remind everybody uh, attending the, um, the session. Please feel free to write a question on the chat and we will pick up them when the speaker completes the presentation. Guido, if you are ready, please feel free to start. Guido, I cannot hear you. Guido, you are muted. You are still muted. You have to click on the mic Hello? icon. Hello, Guido? You no, I yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just, uh, <laughs> the main screen disappeared. So uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I, I couldn't find the button, but uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can see okay, your screen okay. and we can hear you. So please yeah, feel yeah, free yeah. to start. Yes, okay. 
Um, <clears throat> so yes, we are one of the uh, uh, early adapter projects and uh, uh, specifically uh, uh, aimed at this earth observation domain. And um, I don't know, for the, those who don't know uh, what's going on there, there is a, a, a huge program uh, set up by the commission, the Copernicus uh, program that um, produces lots of data, lots of interesting science data. Uh, we in the JRSA also work very much in the policy context. So we, we uh, tend to focus on, on those applications that have a, 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 a relevant value in policy. And in our case, it is the common agricultural uh, policy in, 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 the, in the European Union. Uh, but we very much see also this, um, this element that what we develop in these application domains is also very relevant, very close to science science type use and that's what we are trying to demonstrate in this early adapter project is to see how um, how we can make sure that uh, the these massive data streams that we have and here there are some details on that um, how we can bring these uh, data sets uh, outside the more traditional you know the geospatial domain people that that work with space data as a uh, uh, as a core activity but rather to bring them into uh, uh, land applications, maritime applications that that can derive valuable information from it. We can, we, I mean, in in our context, we focus a lot on agriculture. You can uh, imagine that there is a lot of value in the information from these satellites that uh, is relevant for somebody who does uh, production assessments, uh, crop health status, looking at seasonal changes, etc. So lots of things that have an agronomic um, uh, interest. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to show that this cloudification, so porting all this uh, processing on the cloud and it's specifically on a uh, open science cloud uh, has many benefits. Just to have a quick idea uh, so that I don't have to talk through all the, say the technical data details. This is uh, the kind of uh, 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 sort of context. So you have uh, uh, in general uh, in Europe now quite a few uh, open data sets that are published annu annually. For instance, in the Netherlands, you find uh, every year there's uh, um, uh, crop uh, parcel data uh, for the whole country available. And um, we then uh, cross analyze, uh, analyze that information with uh, satellite data that uh, comes from the Sentinel uh, Copernicus program. And uh, we have two types of uh, uh, data sets there, uh, optical data and radar data. And uh, by combining these many parcels with many uh, uh, different uh, uh, um, tracks from the satellite, because they come over every five to six days, we are able to analyze then. And then if you look in the zoom in, say we have a, a parcel level information that we can analyze um, in any way we want. So we can see whether we can confirm the crop that is declared there, or whether we can see there are, uh, say, uh, anomalies, etc. So. Um, that's a little bit the, the, the overall uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, flow of data. And uh, the, the key element, of course, is that the volumes are quite massive. So if you think about a country of, uh, of the size of the Netherlands, which is about 30,000 square kilometers, you already talk about tens of terabytes of data per year that you need to process. And for that, we propose to use uh, um, cloud solutions. Uh, the Copernicus program has put in place uh, something called DIAS, which is the, the data infrastructure that, uh, uh, that, that should make this data available uh, together with processing uh, um, resources uh, to run this kind of analysis. And um, that is somewhat experimental and it's actually uh, somewhat parallel to um, the, Earth, uh, the uh, European Open Science Cloud. But some of these providers are also integrated, federated in, in, in the uh, EOSC. So that's why it is, uh, you know, quite easy to move from one, say, uh, program part into the uh, open science uh, cloud part. And okay, uh, this, is a, the, this is the typical um, setup that we need. We need uh, access to all this data through, the S, uh, through an S3 store, which has uh, at the moment about 20 petabytes of data. Uh, then we run uh, extractions uh, analysis in parallel on parallel machines uh, for which we also use uh, other than um, the DS type platforms, uh, for instance, Chessnet in the Czech Republic and uh, EODC in Vienna. Um, uh, we, can, we can decide how we uh, set this up. At the moment, we are, for instance, 
running specialized uh, uh, um, uh, processing runs on EODC, uh, while Chestnet is uh, uh, our preferred um, data server uh, node. So the, the, we have the, the very large database there, and we are running uh, a Jupyter Hub and, uh, and um, uh, RESTful services there. So uh, this is a bit uh, the idea that uh, you have uh, this uh, cloud infrastructure that allows you to process all this data, put it available in various, uh, say, reductions, and make that available to the user through uh, uh, notebooks and uh, um, RESTful services. We are using uh, exclusively open source components. So uh, um, have a look at this uh, at leisure when you have the, the, the slides, but uh, it's typical, uh, the processing side, the, the spatial database, and then the, the, whole, the whole Python stack to do uh, uh, analytics. Um, as I said, we basically have a kind of a stacked uh, system that, uh, that uh, gets the data from this huge data store. It reduces things into a Postgres database. database. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, uh, RESTful and uh, Jupyter Hub to make sure that the data is uh, becoming available. Because at the moment, I mean, the infrastructure thing is, is relatively mature at the moment. What we're focusing on is to make sure that the data gets out to the user so that they can do meaningful uh, analysis. Um, uh, and here I'm, I'm listing some of the, uh, this is the, our naming convention that we use in these uh, um, uh, RESTful services, but it's a bit clearer when I, when I run through the, the demonstration slides. Um, so uh, this is the typical way that people can get a, a access to these, uh, to the data. And uh, uh, there are basically, uh, I'm, I'm doing it actually not now live, but uh, as a set of slides. So one of the really, I mean, imagine that there is this huge data store with has, has all the data, it's, it's a global data set. So you can find data all over the globe. And if you are say, if you are not an expert in all these formats and, and the way data is stored, data is organized, uh, um, you know, how to visualize things in, 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 uh, in a multi-band uh, uh, composition, for instance, then, you know, it's a huge hurdle to do that. So what we provide through these RESTful services is to say, look, uh, you can just uh, define your RESTful query, and then you will get, uh, in this case, for instance, you get a, for a particular location, you get a series of pre-prepared um, extracts from this huge data set anywhere in the world, and you can then also provide some parameters to to you know make the make them stretch better or uh, have a have a different band combination. So those are all all details. But what is interesting in this picture, and I could run this live in a this actually runs in a browser. Um, it's just that for a particular period of time, you can uh, request those chips to be generated. So we call them chips because they are small parts of a much larger image. And uh, you can get them at full resolution. That's very important because you always have, want to have uh, the, the, the full detail of the sensor. And then uh, in this case, we do this over Sudan just to show that this is not only limited to some areas in Europe, but it also works uh, um, uh, anywhere in the world. Um, what is more interesting uh, for analysis is, is not to have a visualization, but to have the raw data uh, in order to be able to run real analysis. And here, this is just an example of a segmentation. So what we do here, we use the same RESTful services. You have a, a coordinate for which you have, a, for instance, a, a parcel vector, and you can then uh, request um, the area around that, that parcel and, uh, and then look, for instance, into uh, a segmentation approach to see if you have a homogeneous field or whether your field is, is uh, subdivided in particular parts. These may be indications of... Uh, uh, agriculture activity, like a farmer may be mowing his field or he may be uh, plowing a part of the field. So these are all, say, um, uh, relevant uh, information that relates to um, um, the progress of the season, for instance. Uh, another example is just to get uh, a good overview of uh, what's going on in a particular uh, point of time. Uh, the main message here is not so much this interesting, whether this is an interesting picture or, or not, but that you can actually do um, uh, automatic reported reporting. So you can combine all this information automatically in a service that generates a PDF on, on demand. Um, you can do that together with, uh, uh, say, the graphics here, but also uh, time information, 
uh, attributes from the parcel that you're looking at. And uh, for instance, uh, in overviews like this. So here we combine uh, a time series uh, visualization. So one is coming from one sensor, which is called Sentinel-2, which is an optical sensor from which you also see these uh, nice uh, image chips, which is again, this chips idea. And the other one, the bottom one is, uh, is um, uh, no, it's the other way around. Sorry, the the, the top one is the is the Sentinel one. It's a radar instrument which gives complementary information to what you can derive from uh, from Sentinel two. So again, by comparing these graphs, by understanding what what's happening in the field, in this case, it's a wheat field, uh, you can start to derive information about the progress of the season and and um, uh, similar uh, information that you can relate to crop growth, to crop phenology, uh, to uh, uh, harvest in the end. And that's the sort of aim uh, that we're looking at. Another example where we are specifically looking at uh, when a field appears non-homogeneous, which is a, again, some kind of an in indicator that can be interesting in, in, in a context where you are interested in, uh, in timely events. Uh, this relates a little bit to the CAP because CAP has some very strange specific rules sometimes which say you have to mow a field before a certain date. So it's, it's, it's an indicator that you can use in this, uh, this particular context. But it's also something that you could, uh, for instance, uh, you know, integrate into uh, biodiversity aspects on rules that relate to, you know, the maintenance of uh, bird population. Et I mean, it, this has, a, uh, in the end, of course, a very wide uh, application scope. Um, yeah, just to know, I'll do that maybe at the very end. But um, what we're looking now is that, uh, of course, we have some months to go still with the resources that we have now. Uh, we hope to continue that under, uh, under uh, uh, new headers, uh, if that's possible. Uh, on the other hand, we're also very much interested in exploring this much further as a, as a common tool for our, for our organization. So to, you know, the, the general idea that, that instead of investing in, uh, in um, internal hardware solutions, uh, we are looking at the way to, uh, to port some of this functionality on, a, on a, uh, an open science cloud. So that's, that's definitely part of the picture as well. Then there are some technical issues, of course, related to the further development. Some things are, uh, need a bit more scaling. Uh, we are actually talking to one of the uh, resource providers uh, specifically the one, the, the one that has this huge uh, data archive to see if they cannot make this a, a generic service because this is anyway, it's nice in our project, but it can, uh, it can serve many other users that are not interested in agriculture, but maybe in forestry, in, in snow, in, in, in all the sorts of land processes that are of, of, uh, of relevance. And then, um, then other decisions on how we migrate uh, some of the analy uh, analysis that we currently run on the client uh, onto the server. Uh, uh, some other more far-fetched ideas that involve the use of GPUs to do very fast processing on demand, etc. So this is actually, it's actually a framework that allows us to, to uh, consider many directions, both, both at the very basic technical level uh, to all the way, uh, say, to make sure that people can easily and quickly uh, run analysis of their, of their interest. And if you're interested in this and you, you would like to be involved or uh, get some, some, uh, some uh, code, etc., uh, you can contact us. Um, very quickly, just a very, um, uh, one of the latest uh, <laughs> development is, is not so, maybe not so relevant, but just an example. Here we are using a Pi Deck. So this is, a, I don't know if you know about it, it's a WebGL um, that is now uh, integrated in Deck GL which has a Python binding as well. So you can, with the same infrastructure that I just show you, you can actually start to generate interesting visualizations like what we do here. This is somewhere in Spain where uh, it's an artificial uh, visualization of an area that, is, uh, that has uh, a number of uh, agricultural parcels. And the parameter that we use here to uh, set the height of the polygon relates to how diverse that parcel is. So this is a a typical example of a quick uh, way to visualize data that can be used to, uh, to again, uh, have a kind of an inspection uh, um, focus. So you can quickly show this. Uh, this generates in, in, a, 
directly from the database in, in a less than a minute and is of course also uh, uh, visible on uh, 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 normal browsers but also on, on on the phone so you can can imagine that you can serve this kind of information to people that work in the field and that want actual information derived from uh, the latest satellite for instance etc so again it's just uh, to um, to show uh, that uh, this is all uh, very nicely extendable in uh, in in many many directions okay uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that because i think my time's up so uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Thank you very much, Guido, for the very interesting presentation. I don't see question in the chat. From, uh, from one side, uh, uh, I think what you mentioned is about making this tool uh, more general, a general services that can service that can be used by more different use cases. It looks very interesting. It can be a very nice result for the Red Doctor program. How, 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 you, how are you thinking to follow up on this? Um, yes, I mean, uh, as I said, we have a uh, we have already a particular user community that is very interested in this that uh, uh, we will continue to work with, but um, um, we uh, intend to actually push out the code. Uh, I, I can't say how soon, but the idea is that we will put it on our uh, uh, on our GitHub. We have a, a new GitHub now. I'm now actually busy with uh, um, sorting out um, more or less the IPR. I, I don't think there's much IPR problems involved here, but I, I formally mm -hmm. have to sort it out. So that's uh, because we think that um, that uh, most of our code is uh, what we call syntactic glue, right? So we use many of the existing libraries, put them together to run this kind of functional. You see that most of the components are, are open source. So um, that's one thing. So we want to uh, make sure that, uh, that uh, as many people are exposed to this kind of uh, thing. Uh, uh, what is really important is that we think that there is a, a bit of a gap in education. So that will also help, of course, if we can push out our code we can show pragmatic, uh, say practical examples that others can build on, uh, because um, there is a bit of, a, I would even say there's a bit of a reluctance uh, of people to, um, you know, to consider cloud solutions because it's still a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, people have the idea that it gets out of their hands and that kind of stuff. So I think there's still quite a bit of uh, education to be done and that's what we, what we aim at most. Um, Obviously, if I compare to uh, uh, the previous speaker, we, we have not yet integrated so many uh, of the, uh, say, infrastructure components of the of EGI uh, uh, EOC, like uh, single sign-on, but that's something that we should definitely uh, consider as well. Um, and then for us, what is really important is that um, now with the new Digital Euro program, where there is a bigger push for a permanent, let's say, a more permanence of... Uh, of the open science cloud and coupling that with HPC and then European data spaces. So we think that, uh, that it, uh, I would say it still takes some discussion to sort out how, where that is going exactly, but that's definitely our, our uh, has our interest because I think that that will make sure that this is becoming a, say a standard solution that has a long-term uh, support. Okay, Guido, thank you very much again for your presentation. Let's uh, go ahead uh, with the next speaker, that is Alexander Yakutovich from EPF, EPFL, sorry, that uh, will present the OpenAI the Lab Platform pilot. Hello. Um, Hello, Alexander. Yeah, you can hear me well, right? Yes. Perfect. So, um, do you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. The slide out. Okay, play. Fine. Okay. So, um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Alexander Yukotovic, and I am a postdoc at EPFL CEO. Uh, so, in this presentation, I'm going to introduce uh, our OpenAI Lab platform that is actually designed for to do cloud computing and material science. Um, before I start into introducing the platform itself, um, let me take a step back and make, uh, let's say, more general overview of science. So we have currently three pillars of science, which is um, uh, experiment done mostly by experimentalists. Then we have, um, of course, theory that is done by 
um, theoretical and computational scientists. And those two pillars were like, say, uh, let's say the oldest ones that exist for a long time. Uh, while the third pillar uh, called simulation has been uh, introduced uh, rather recently in the last uh, few decades. And so far, simulations are mostly done by uh, computational scientists. Um, and this is a pretty strange situation because in principle, simulations are uh, is a tool that can be used both by experimentalists to compare their results to the results of them simulations also uh, and also by obviously by theoretical uh, scientists uh, who can uh, run their uh, experimental models uh, so, sorry theoretical models uh, on the computers and um, therefore we would like to change the status quo that computations are nowadays mostly done by computational scientists and we would like to offer the possibility for uh, let's say a larger scientific audience to have access to the simulations and that's the main reason why we introduced IDLAB. IDLAB is, um, uh, is a platform that is uh, fully based on AIDA. And AIDA is, a, is a quite a powerful tool by itself, but it has been developed mostly for computational scientists. So as you can see, this person who actually work, interacts with AIDA is a computational scientist. And um, the tool by itself is pretty powerful. It, can, <clears throat> it allows you to run complex workflows. So in material science, it is quite a rare case where you need to do only one simulation if you want to compute a, a certain property. Typically, you involve uh, multiple steps, uh, sometimes even multiple codes to arrive from, let's say, from a material to, to the property you're looking for. Also, AIDA uh, comes with a built-in feature of uh, storing the data. So uh, when you build, uh, let's say, when we call them plugins, so the plugin allows AIDA to interact with a given code. You specify which exactly data you would like to store, and AIDA, once this is done, AIDA will uh, take care of that automatically. So AIDA will store the input data of your simulations in the database. AIDA will also store the output data, and obviously the link between input and output data so that you can uh, keep the data provenance. So you can basically uh, if you obtain a certain property, you can go back in the history and um, arrive to the to the material for which this property has has been computed. You can obviously look at the uh, what steps were needed to uh, to arrive to, uh, to this property to compute this property. Um, however, Aida has a Python or command line interface. Therefore, it cannot be. Let's say it's not. Uh, it cannot be really used by a wide, audi uh, wide audience of scientists, and this is exactly why we introduced uh, IDLA platform, which is fully integrated data. So it comes uh, uh, with all the nice properties of IDLA. Um, but in addition to, to all of these um, complex workflows that we have developed. Uh, we provide a user-friendly web interface to which a, a scientist, uh, experimentalist or computational scientist can uh, submit the simulations. Um, IDLAB by itself is uh, based on, uh, on Jupyter. So uh, if you would like to make any application, if you would like to develop any application, you would do it directly in Python. And in addition to that, we provide a collaborative environment. So um, anything, any application that you you uh, you build can be shared with the community through the application store that we have in IDLAB. And we, so uh, IDLAB comes with a uh, handy set of visualization and editing tools. So if you need, if you'd like to build your own application, uh, you can uh, of course use the library that we have developed. It allows you to to manage the um, uh, to manage the simulations and uh, to manage preparation of your data for the simulations. So um, here I would like to give, give a quick overview of the IDLAB interface. Uh, on this uh, page, you see the home page of IDLAB. Uh, so on top, you have the uh, home application uh, that is visually different from all the other apps that, are, um, that have this rectangle. So uh, the reason is that the home application cannot be uninstalled and uh, it comes together with IDLA. While all the, all the other applications are completely manageable, so you can uh, change the position, you can install, uninstall, or update them. And um, thanks to the integration with Git, so uh, all the applications, essentially, if you would like to register your application in uh, IDLAB, application store, what you have to do is just to essentially to go to, to the IDLAB application database and uh, put there the link uh, to your um, uh, GitHub 
um, to your GitHub page, so the way we, uh, where the application is uh, located. And once this is done, uh, our automatic tools will keep it up, pick, uh, pick it up, and also will notify the users who will install your application about possible updates. Essentially, if you uh, if you keep developing your application uh, and uh, at some point you make a release of your in your repository. Uh, the automated tools uh, that are coming together with Said Lab will automatically detect that and notify users about uh, a new update of your application. And uh, as it was already, I guess, clear previously, the uh, for sharing the application, we essentially use uh, GitHub. So any application that is uh, placed on GitHub and also uh, and linked to it is put to our Aida Lab uh, registry will be. Uh, available for downloading and installing on Idlab. So this was a quick overview of, of um, Idlab. And now I would like to give a, um, let's say, to summarize uh, what we have done. Uh, this is a paper that we have, uh, that has been accepted recently. So uh, in this paper, you can find the, uh, the, plat the, the platform description. You can find the key components of which uh, IDLAB is based on, on which IDLAB is based on. Uh, you can also read about the platform design and uh, the modes of distribution in particular. And uh, what I'd like to mention that uh, this, despite being a uh, cloud application, you can also install IDLAB on your local uh, computer and uh, try it out. And we also provide, in this paper, we also provide some use cases how IDLAB has been employed in the real life uh, science. So we have, uh, we, we basically discussed three tools. Uh, one tool for computing electronic properties of graphene non-ribbons. Then we have uh, on-surface chemistry application and scanning probe microscopy application. All right, so now I would like to give a short video so that it gives you a kind of understanding how IDLAB works. So in this uh, video, um, I'll be showing how to submit a geometry optimization uh, of a given structure. So this is the, um, the IDLAB application. So as you can see, you can uh, select multiple source where you take your structure from. Here I'll be taken from my computer. And uh, uh, things, thanks to the modularity of IDLAB, you can add uh, as many structure editors as you want. So here uh, I'm employing framework cleaner. So the framework cleaner will essentially find the solvent molecule and, um, and select them. So what I'll do, I'll delete, the, delete all the solvent molecule and I will also delete all the atomic overlaps. So once um, this is done, so here you see that uh, atoms that have overlap are selected. So I'll just uh, delete one of those. Once this is done, I uh, provide some description to the structure, and then I store the structure in IDA database. Then what is left for me to do is to select the code on which I'll be running my simulation and the number of uh, processors uh, that will be used for this task. And then I'll select the protocol. And that's done. So as you can see, the interface is pretty easy. So essentially everyone with a basic understanding of what is going on can submit such a simulation. Then um, once the simulation is done and the structure is optimized, I can um, launch so-called um, isotherm simulation. So here I'll be taking the structure from the database already optimized. Um, and then um, here, as you can see, the structure is exactly the same. I'll simply define a certain set of parameters. I'll uh, define which molecule I would like to insert in the structure to compute isotherm. I'll, I'll specify the temperature and um, some uh, simulation parameters that I'm not going to focus on. And finally, I'm going to define the pressure range. So from which pressure uh, to which I'm going to compute the isotherm. And then I will select the code. Uh, I need two codes for this particular uh, work chain. One is uh, Z++ and another is RASP. And I hit submit and then simulation will be started. You don't need to keep this app uh, open so you can close it. Uh, AIDA will take care of um, bringing back the results automatically. Once the data are computed, you can uh, select again the molecule that you would like to see. I'll, I'll be seeing CO2. You take one particular structure and then um, the, the, the structure together with the isotherm will be displayed for you so you can uh, explore it. If you are interested in comparing your uh, uh, theoretical uh, isotherm with the experiment one, you can easily insert it and then uh, two, uh, two plots will be overlaid. And finally, uh, all the data are obviously uh, accessible and you can also download them as a CSV and import them into Excel if you'd like to compare them uh, to something else. 
Um, all right, so this is um, this is how you can submit uh, simulation in the 4D visitor. Um, another example I would like to uh, show is an example from another laboratory, which is mostly focused on electronic properties. So here I'm going to show a, um, a short video how you can search. Um, so I, I'm not going to show how you submit simulation because the, this is pretty much the same. Here I'm going to show only how to sort the results of the electronic structure calculation that uh, were done here. So this is graphing uh, another ribbon. And as you can see, uh, you had a, there was a database. So we selected the particular structure from the data database. And then we have the, uh, the computer electronic properties. It's all um, interactive. So you can see the structure, the 3D structure, orbitals, and everything. You can also change uh, the, the band. And then uh, the uh, 3D representation of the orbitals will get adapted according. You can also see the spin density. And um, another thing that um, I'm going to show is the PDOS. Uh, for those of you who is familiar with material science, you probably know how difficult it is in the standard framework to, to compute project density of state. So here, um, this is fully automated. You just select the atoms on which you would like to project the density. And then essentially the, the plot will be shown. So um, this is those two videos were uh, essentially to show the capability of, I, of IDA Lab and also to demonstrate the fact that uh, we had like two completely different uh, applications, but they were all uh, done and um, managed through IDA Lab. So IDA Lab essentially doesn't put any restriction on the domain of science you're working on. Uh, in the, and the application you can develop uh, can be really specific to the task, but the tools that you use are pretty general. So the structure visualization, the uh, plotting tools, they're all the same. You just uh, uh, combine them in a tool that um, that is tailored for a specific application. So um, as you, pro um, if you're familiar with development, uh, you probably um, know that uh, the bugging is a quite an important task and also uh, we need to provide some test infrastructure, otherwise uh, you will experience uh, that your apps are breaking them every now and then. Uh, if, you are, if you introduce a small change, then that can uh, have a, an unexpected consequences. So therefore we provided a test infrastructure for the IDLAB applications. So this is a GitHub action that essentially will do, uh, will kind of simulate the behavior of the user. So it will open your application, will uh, click on a certain button, say screenshots and GitHub artifacts, and um, basically to set it up, it's pretty simple. So, all right, so I'm already at the end of my presentation. I will, I hope I convince you that GitLab is a very nice tool for, for the collaboration because it allows uh, people with different expertise to, uh, to collaborate on a common computational project. It last, allows to save time and avoid uh, making mistakes because uh, all the steps uh, are essentially automated and you are left uh, with the final results. And um, thanks to the modularity of IDLAB setup, you can build your own application that is really tailored for the specific, uh, for the specific application. So here are some links. Um, I don't know if, they have, if they, my presentation will be available, but uh, just to show that we have um, uh, IDLAB, so we can read about IDLAB uh, on this link. We have also GitHub organization. If you're interested in the development, you can join it. We have the paper print on our on archive. And soon there will be a paper on, um, on another journal. And then we have open IDLAB demonstrator that has been created thanks to uh, collaboration with uh, ELSC. And then if you would like to get in touch, just write email um, uh, to idlab.org. So finally, I would like to thank the developer team and um, all the funding agency for supporting the project. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander, for your presentation and also for the demo. Um, the slide will be available after the conference to the website in the agenda. Um, I, I, I'd like to, I have to skip the question, Alexander, since we are a bit late, sorry for this. But anyway, thanks a lot for the very nice slide presentation. Let's move to the next speaker, that is Sergei Gorbianin from Equin, that will present the pilot supporting fair data discoverability in clinical research. Sergei, yeah. please yeah. feel free to share your screen. You should see my screen. Yes, okay. I can see the slide. Sorry, it's good. Uh, try to go full oh. screen. Mm. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. 
Uh, hello everyone, my name is Sergey Gurain and uh, I'm a data scientist from Ekrin. And today I would like to present to you the Metadata Repository project, which we continue to develop within the EOS Hub EAP program. So, and um, first of all, I'd like to start to, and to talk about the problems which most of uh, clinical scientists and researchers face when they try to work with uh, clinical trials information. And the first main problem here is that uh, clinical studies and related data objects can be stored on the different websites, publications, repositories, registries, databases, and, and so on. So it's, you can imagine that it's very time consuming to find necessary information in those uh, big number of uh, uh, sources. The second main problem here is that uh, the mechanism for gaining access vary between different places and different data objects. So, for example, some of uh, data sources can provide an access to their data via API, or they can uh, provide the possibility to download their data in the CSV or PDF format, or probably some of the data sources do not provide anything. So you have to scrape the information from the website, which is also very problematic for the researchers and uh, take a lot of time to solve this. The third problem here is that uh, there is no grid discovery metadata schemas implemented and used for discovery. And uh, those three problems create the last one and the main probably that uh, the overall findability of uh, studies and related data, data objects is difficult and uh, time consuming process. Uh, just a few words uh, before I'll go forward. So on this slide, I described the two main data types. Uh, you could uh, see on the previous one, on the previous slide, that within the MDR, we are working with the two main data types. It's a study and the data object. So the difference is that uh, study object mainly contain the core information about the clinical, any clinical trial. So it, can, it may contain the study titles, study participants list, uh, um, study types, study, study status, alternative titles, and so on. And the data object is a kind of extension for this information, which may be represented as uh, the document or as a data set or media file, or for example, statistical analysis file and something like that. So they should be linked uh, normally between themselves, but it's not always possible because, for example, study information may be stored on uh, such resources as uh, clinicaltrials.gov and uh, uh, data object can be stored, for example, on PubMed. So in most cases, uh, scientists and uh, clinical researchers have to go through all these data sources to find the information related to each other of uh, the data object types and link this information between themselves. So that's why we decided to solve this problem for the researchers and scientists and uh, create the MDR, which will contain uh, the standardized linked uh, metadata about clinical trials and uh, related data objects so between studies and data objects. So now let's talk about the implementation. The MDR portal has been developed within the collaboration of with our partners, OneData and INFN, exploring mainly the OneData system. We as Ekrin are responsible for the download and processing of data. So we uh, extracted the information from more or less 18 data sources uh, and uh, generate the JSON files, which contain the studies and data object information inside. And uh, after that, we transform, we transfer these JSON files to one data system. And uh, NFN here, they provide for us the hardware support and they develop for us uh, Elasticsearch engine, or not develop, but help to integrate the Elasticsearch engine to the portal. 
And on this slide, you can see the more detailed explanation of how it works, how the overall MDR uh, organized and works. Um, at the beginning, we analyze and process manually each data source. After that, we extract metadata from each of those data sources and put into individual databases and schemas, saving original metadata structure. Then we run ETL processes, which mainly contain uh, standardization and uh, linkage between uh, themselves. Once it's done, uh, it becomes available to in our core database, which we call MDR core database. And uh, right after that, we generate the JSON files. Each JSON file contains study or data object information with the link to necessary study or data objects. Once uh, the JSON files are ready, we transfer this data, we, I would say, inject uh, these uh, JSON files to one data system, to the one provider, and uh, with help of Elasticsearch, we index right after uh, this information, this JSON files uh, through Elasticsearch. And uh, finally, this information become available for uh, the users through the web portal interface. I will demonstrate to you later on how it works in practice. So just a few words about our current progress we have. So we, as I said before, we collect the studies and data object records from more than 18 data sources, including clinical trials to go, BioLink, PubMed, etc., And metadata from those sources have been collected and linked. We have developed a single and universal metadata scheme. Uh, these schemas are very clear and straightforward. So they're available by clicking on uh, these links. So you can take a look if you want later on. And uh, in total, we have in our MDR more than uh, 1 million and 300 of thousands uh, studies and data objects uploaded, including for sure COVID-19 related trials, which is very important for now. Um, we evaluated usability and user satisfaction uh, of our web portal. We recruited 14 uh, testers from clinical trials units or national hubs of national scientific networks from 12, I guess, yeah, 12 countries and collected their feedbacks. So in general, they found the MGR very useful, user-friendly and easy to use. So we can say that they are quite satisfied with our system. As you can see, and uh, as you may understand that we included MDR in early adapter program because it helps a lot for such infrastructures as Equin uh, to get support from more experienced uh, and advanced infrastructures like OneData and INFN to develop uh, and extend our solutions. So within the ESHUB AP program, uh, our main focus is on the revision of the web portal, on investigation of the different mechanisms for accessing and creating metadata stores, and the continuation to developing uh, Elasticsearch-based APIs. So, uh, in general, those APIs are ready, but we have to test them. Uh, after that, we will collect data on the user actions and uh, collect user feedbacks. If you want to see more details about uh, our project, you can go to our wiki, which is publicly available. Uh, here, you can see here the information about the project, um, about our schemas. Those schemas are available on the following link, like study schema JSON and object schema JSON. Uh, you can see the list of uh, data structures, data extraction procedures, etc. So you can go to our weekend and uh, see and find there more details about our project. And uh, I think it's time for a short demo of our project. 
So to go to our portal, you have to type CR MDR in the browser. After that, you will be redirected to the web portal itself. Uh, web portal is a kind of plugin or extension for uh, the overall one data platform, which was developed by one data team. Um, the top um, panel of the portal contains the search panel. Uh, it has uh, several search types, which you can use. You can find the necessary information or you can find a specific study uh, by using trial registry ID, founder's ID, sponsor ID, and so on. Or you can use study characteristic parameters to find the study, for example, title or topic. Or you can uh, find it by DOI, which is parameter related to data objects, right? data object identifier. Uh, the left side is represented with uh, filters. Uh, you can use them to filter uh, your information, uh, for example, studies and data objects. Uh, on the bottom, you can see more legal information uh, about uh, the MGR. And on the right side, you can see the help uh, icon. By clicking on this icon, you will be redirected to the page where you can see more detailed explanation how to use uh, our portal and different types of search. Um, let's take a look and uh, try to find some study. Uh, in this example, I would like to find OmniHeart clinical trial. So I found this information. Uh, each record represented in the content area uh, represent, uh, is represented as an expansion panel. By click on each panel, you will be you will see the description of uh, the study and the list of related date objects with the, the year publication year and access type so the green icon here uh, shows any type of public access uh, the orange icon uh, shows there's uh, any type of restricted access uh, there is also a red icon uh, which shows no access or the data objects or very limited access. You have to send the request to uh, the data object provider and request this information from them. So let's take a look at any data object. So for example, if I click on show more, I will see the data object link. Uh, for example, in this case, it's clinicaltrials.gov. And by clicking on this link, I'll be directed to the uh, source of this information and I can see more details here or I can go to find the um, journal article from the list. And uh, by clicking on this, I will be redirected to the journal article, which is published on the PubMed uh, data source. And uh, I can see more detailed information about this. Thank you for your time and for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Sergey, for the presentation. Uh, also, in this case, I, I prefer to skip the questions since we are late with the, with the schedule. Sergey, if you can please send me the slide uh, after the session so I can make it in them available for interested people to the conference website. Yeah, sure, I will do that. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the last pilot of this section. Uh, Vincent Negre from EVA will present the pilot towards an infrastructure for plant phenotyping. Vincent. We can see your slide. Uh, you are still muted, maybe. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. But we can't we can't see the slide anymore. Okay. I don't see my slide. 
<laughs> disappeared. Just a minute. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Sorry. Don't worry. Maybe you can try to stop the sharing and uh, sharing a uh, check the uh, open line and sharing again. Okay, now I can see them. Sorry, that. Sorry for that. Hello, everyone. No I'm Vincent Negre, uh, and I'm a computer scientist working for the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food, and Environment. And thank you for having the opportunity to, to present our project called Toward an e Infrastructure for Plant Phenotyping. First, some background information about plant phenotyping. This is uh, the study of the interaction between many plant varieties sold in diverse environmental scenarios, including climate, various climatic conditions, watering regimes, soil content, or chemical treatment. And the effect of this interaction are dynamically measured on the observable characteristic of the plant, also called the tray, on a large number of plants. This trait can be measured automatically in some greenhouse facilities or in the field. Traits could also be measured manually by some visu visual inspections. And climatic conditions are also recorded thanks to a network of sensors installed in field or greenhouse. Here you have an, an overview of the facilities installed in France within the Phenom Emphasis Network and infrastructure. These platforms are running in production. On the, on the top, you can see a conveyor belt, which allow to transport plants through imaging cabins. On the plants have been digitalized. Some algorithm allow to reconstruct the 3D structure of plants. Large facilities have also been install on fields. Here on the top uh, right, a facility is called Feno3C, which is composed of a rolling shelter, allowing the, to control the amount of rain on the field. Here you can also see an innovative robot con called Phenomobile, which have been designed to enabling canopy imaging. We are also using a drone to uh, digitize wall canopy. So data coming from this platform are complex and uh, quite heter heterogeneous. This include different scale from microscopic to macroscopic level, different level of interaction with climatic conditions or contain pathogen or competition between plants. Data is produced from various contexts, including obic, greenhouse, field platform, or even farm. We study many different uh, crop species at uh, various uh, stage of uh, development. Regarding the data volume, it's quite large. One experiment generated between two and uh, 15 terabytes of uh, images and produced 10 million of row, row of data stored in the databases, mainly for the climatic condition. At the um, level of the phenomenon for this project, we carry out about 20 experiments per year for a total data production over than 100 terabytes per year. So we are facing th three uh, main data challenges. The first one is to manage large and complex data set, especially because the experiments are expensive, require a lot of uh, resources, and often are hard to re reproduce, reproduce uh, mainly because of the changing uh, climatic condition. The second challenge is, is we need transparency and reproducibility, which is possible with the use of uh, metadata. And the last one is to make data valuable. This includes 
data sharing, production of knowledge and support for decision process. To address these challenges, we need an e-infrastructure to store, describe, analyze, and share data. That's why we have developed an information system called FIS for phenotyping hybrid information system. This is an ontology driven information system. The main uh, concept are uh, the scientific object, which could be plant organ, plot, or whatever entity being measured. We also record event. We give uh, some information about the context of the measure. Trade document observation are associated with this uh, object and event. We also uh, support an hierarchy and link between this object and, and event. And this hierarchy and link are done by uh, following a control semantic. And the last, not the least, each element is identified by some unique resource identifier. Here are the several layers of the information system, a communication layer based on some web, web services which implement the standard API, a semantic layer which makes links between scientific objects stored in database or on a distributed file system. And the last component is a specific computation, computation and workflow layer based on Galaxy and R. This information system has been deployed for the nine platform of the French phenotyping network Phenom and Phasis. And now we want to disseminate our information system to a wider audience, such as the European plant phenotyping network, which gather uh, 22 partners and 31 facilities platform. To reach uh, this objective, we need the support of the EOSC services. That's why we have integrated the early adopter program because we need a scalable and robust resources and services. And we are, we are also interested by new innovative services to offer uh, new possibilities to our community. We are expecting to use the following services for our pilot. First, we are using the EGI cloud services to deploy our information system on virtual machine. This service is very convenient and flexible. We have a complete control on the resources and we can run machine on demand depending of our need. Second, we have also integrated uh, EGI checking service for authentication. It's also very convenient because it's it allows the user to select their preferred identity provider to log in. Um, most of the institutional accounts are supported and you can even log in uh, with some public account like Google, uh, Facebook or, or whatever else. Regarding uh, the storage, we want to compare two distributed storage services based on uh, iRod on one part and one, and one data for the other part. Regarding to the computing layer of our information system, we plan to integrate the EGI notebook for interactive uh, analysis of data. Here is the current status of uh, our pilot. So as I say, information system have uh, already been deployed on the EGI cloud. We have also integrated the uh, EGI checking services. Now we are working uh, on the storage services we have already integrated uh, the IROD's uh, uh, services operated by France Grille. The one data infrastructure is already ready. And now we have to connect it with our information system. And uh, we also plan to integrate uh, EGI notebook. But you don't start it this again. Some uh, feedback and uh, lesson learned. So, uh, we appreciate the, the excellent uh, follow-up of the early, early ad adopter project, thanks to month, monthly meeting and discussion with the expert. Thank Diego and colleague for that. Um, resource centers provide a very efficient and reactive uh, support also. So we are very happy with that. Some um, maybe remark or, or limitation, it's quite, quite difficult to, to, to estimate needs and services we we need at the early steps of the project. So it's quite tricky to, uh, 
to, to have a right technical plan. And maybe this technical plan uh, should have to be updating during uh, uh, or before the end of the, the project. Uh, there, there is lots of information available within the EOSC marketplace or within the EGI wiki. Hundreds of services are available, so it could be tricky to find the relevant one. So this discussion with expert and support of the expert are very welcome. And last remark, probably we a little bit under, and underestimate the effort for integrated EOSC services within uh, our uh, information system. Some perspective, as I say, we, uh, we use uh, ontology technology. So we are interesting to, to use some semantic services provided by uh, the EOSC portal. This could, could be some low level services like a triple store or a complete semantic portal like bio portal or agro portal. I, and we are also interested by integrating some uh, uh, high level visualization services to uh, efficiently analyze our data. Thank you for, for your atten attention. Thank you very much, Vincent, for your presentation. And uh, thanks also for the feedback uh, you provided to the program. About one of the points that you, you have said uh, that is sometimes complex, uh, defining a taking up plan the start and then following it uh, step by step. I fully agree with you. Some flexibility is needed. So um, don't worry about that. We can, if there is the need to change something, we can discuss and we can try to find uh, the the best solution for your pilot so we have opened up on this okay uh, okay um, i'd like to thank you again all the speakers for the presentation i think we before were reported uh, were summarized the status of advancement of of the of the pilots under the ISO scale adopted program I would like uh, also to thank the attendees of this session that uh, Richard with us till the end. And I will remind the, the presentation of today will be made available to the, to the conference website. And, um, and uh, the and um, Sorry, and uh, and then in the EOSCAB website, there is also a dedicated section on the Early Adopter Program, and then you can have a look to get more insight about about uh, uh, your your time. There is a comment, no? Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I think we can close the session. Thanks, thanks again. Bye Thank bye. You. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Diego. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thanks again for your...